I missed my deadline for the submission this week and or this month, I guess. And I, it's very hot outside, but I hope that nonetheless you can settle in with a book and a cold glass of iced tea. And uh, this is the book. This is the arms of a hero. Arliser. The following morning, as I went down to the gun deck for breakfast, I heard I could hear shouting. Most of the crew of the Vinamoinen was off with their families and friends celebrating the new year and the start of winter. I rushed the west of the way down the ladder, worried about the commotion. But it was just some of the crewmen arm wrestling Rhea. Rhea won. They celebrated raucously. It was a lot of noise for just a half dozen people. I quietly sidled up to a table next to them. Rhea looked over and smiled at me, nodding to me in greeting. I nodded back. I'm very slid under my table dramatically, lounging on one side. Happy New Year, Arliser. Do you like your eggs with cheese? I nodded, smiling at the grin on his face. He sleight of handed two pastel colored eggs out from behind his ears. It, that was his magic. I loved it. All of his crewmen turned to watch, grinning back infectiously. Extra cheesy? I huffed as he burst into laughter. It wasn't that funny. His crewmen disagreed, laughing uproariously. Drunk already, it seemed. But it was the New Year's, and they weren't going anywhere. Einvar tossed the eggs over to a little lady who miraculously caught them and got up to go cook. Einvar slid into a proper chair at the table, letting his crewmen go back to their game. Rio won against the next man, too. His armor was shining and clean now. In fact, he looked so much more put together now, with his hair combed back and in proper clothes. He cleaned up nicely. I got a whole shark for us today, so we won't have to go out anywhere. We have fried strips for this morning and soup for all day. I nodded to him, still watching Rhea. His arms were incredibly complex. With the rust and dirt kicked on, I hadn't seen all the tiny intricacies, but cleaned up. As the men patted him on the back and congratulating him, I stood and went over to the challenger's seat and took it, placing my arm on the table silently. The men quieted. Rio gave me a gentle smile and took my arm. Mostly, I wanted a closer look at his arm. I gave up almost immediately as he slammed my arm to the table. The east sparkled on it, patterns of animation, strength, and protection. The crewmen gently tried to console me. They were always very respectful of me. I shook my head and gave him a little grin. Part of what gave his arm supernatural strength was that it showed the east particles of the things that it touched. I drew a symbol on my own arm with my own east to cut off my sense of fatigue and put a glove to guard against the east slowing field. With that, I sent my arm back on the table. Rio flexed and drew his finger along the curve on the side before he took mine again. His arm was fully alight this time. He really was a mage too then, just as the legends had said. Why wasn't he missing an eye? His grip locked onto mine. I held my arm firm. I was probably straining my muscles competing with a monster like that. But I wasn't going to tire. I held his gaze evenly. He smiled competitively. I can do this all day, Rio said. I couldn't hope to outlast a man's whole east supply. It would doubtlessly strain me more than necessary. I started to draw a pattern, to, a force pattern under the table, trying to move the air currents in my favor. Rio narrowed his eyes and caught my hand beneath the table, stopping me. I tried to hold my hand. I tried to hold my a pull my hand free, but he held firm. It was my scarred hand. I couldn't hope to defeat even a normal man with that hand. I wasn't going to win without magic, and my right arm was going to late ache later. I'd damage it if I went any further. Right as I was about to let my arm fall, though, he lifted his thumb from my hand, and all the stiffness vanished from the metal. His arm clinked to the table beneath mine. The table went wild, cheering and patting me on the back. We raised his mug to me and drank with a wink. I felt my scarf flushing with heat, both from using up my ease and also this strange gift. A small glory. One of the crewmen patted him on the back hard, laughing at his inability to win against a little girl. A mug of mead was shoved at me in celebration and the, the crewmen still cheering. And soon after, my food came out. It smelled very much like fish and it was warm and appropriately crunchy. My arm were hurt as the block wore off, but it had been worth it. I had learned something about how his arms worked. 
and I learned he was willing to let a little girl beat him in arm wrestling if it made her happy. That is chapter five. Um, reading it again, I am distinctly aware of how amateur some of this sounds. Like, the following morning as I went down to the gun deck, Herakris, I could hear shouting. I could just describe the shouting. I don't need to... It's clear that she hears it if, if she's saying they're shouting. Um... I also spelled I'm far differently in this chapter in comparison to every other chapter, so that's pretty funny. I spelled it with um, an A, Y, M, V, A, R instead of Y, M, V, E, R. Um, what else would I want to change in, in a rewrite of this? Um, oh, there's a lot of parts where I just sort of edited it as I spoke, just like... Um, Like, uh, I think at the bottom of the second page here, um, I started to draw a force pattern under the table, trying to move the air currents. My favorite, Rio narrowed his eyes and caught my hand beneath the table, stopping me, blah, 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 blah. I guess, mm, yeah, I didn't, I don't know, I don't remember now. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's what's been up with that. Um, this chapter is very fluff-based, It's but it's like fluff cozy especially after the angst the last two mm, and it sort of show starts showing you what kind of person Rio really is that he's not just like a hero in name that he actually cares about people in like a human way um I think the ending is a little bit too uh telling instead of showing I think it's very obvious what the meta message of this chapter is upon rereading it um but, you know, this was like four years ago me writing so I, I don't think it's terrible but it's definitely amateur um, in other news, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about what I've been working on in my current work before I, uh, leave you all to go about the rest of your days. Um, I've been working on outlining, I, I'm actually almost done with all of Arliser's story here. Um, I'm coming, I say I'm coming up at the end, but more realistically, I am, uh, I am a year or two out, um, in terms of writing, but I have, um, I have, I'm starting to plan it out, I'm starting to be able to see where it needs to go, um, and, uh, I do, so I am not a pantser, uh, I am definitely a plotter more so, um, but I'm not the kind of person that, like, writes out literally all the details beforehand, but what I do do is I mm, plan out um, all of the scenes, um, at least I try to, uh, beforehand, and I'll do it, um, as I get to every major character arc, so, like, The Fall of Thule, um, is, uh, the, the name, I think, of the first arc, and that one, um, is about, uh, well, it's, I mean, I guess if you're listening to this, you might not want to be spoiled, so, no spoilers, but, um, you know, whoops, fall of fool. Anyway, um, over the course of this, however, um, there's like one character arc, and I would plan all of that, and then when I get to the end of that, I see where everybody is, and what pieces I've got, and what pieces I still need to do, and I plan out the next one. Um, and I usually go do scene by scene, letter, world letter by world letter, but I also, and then when I get to each scene, I plan out what's going to happen exactly in that scene. Like, I'll have, like, four bullet points, or four to, like, eight bullet points for it. And then, um, recently my process has been to write the dialogue and then to put in the action and narrative later. Um, dialogue just comes to my head easier, even though I've been told that I'm bad at it, honestly. Uh, uh, especially earlier on in college, I had all of my friends saying that, like, oh, Belle, all your writing just sounds like you, but you trying to be other people, but I can still tell that it's you. Um, and I've been working really hard on trying to make my character voices more distinct and stuff, but I haven't really gotten any word on if I have gotten any better at that. But at the same time, I'm also not that worried about having a distinct writing style. Like, obviously, the ideal would be that I can just, I can write in whatever style is most suited to the story and to the character. Um, but I'm also not opposed to having a distinct writing voice either, especially because that means it's easier to, I guess, like, market myself and have, like, an image. I mean, and some people aren't going to vibe with my voice, but some people aren't going to vibe with my content or whatever characters or whatever either, so I'm okay 
uh, being known. I would much rather be known for my voice and have everybody say that it's and have it be really controversial. I wouldn't want everybody to hate it, but mm, if everyone said it was really con, if some people were like, "Oh, I love her voice," and other people were like, mm, "Oh, she's just too voicey and pretentious," like that would be the dream. Um, but yeah, so I've been working on mm, doing that, and I've discovered I have so many characters. This mm, first section was kind of controlled because I mm, was very distinctly trying to keep it to like one character per faction. But as I've been writing more, and I said this in a community post the other day, but as I've been writing more, I've been wanting to lean into the fact that the world has a lot of people in it, and it takes all of those people to make the world uh, move forward. Like, you think about, for example, like, everyone's like, oh, Leonardo da Vinci was such an incredible artist and an incredible thinker for his time, but you know that man wasn't doing his own cooking, probably. You know he wasn't doing his own laundry. Laundry back then was this super complicated art of knowing, like, what chemicals and stuff you used for what type of fabric and how you didn't, you know, how you were supposed to avoid certain ones or else you'd remove the dyes. It was a whole thing. Like, nowadays, you can kind of get away with just picking whatever detergent or whatever and running it on the day of, but, you know, you, they actually used a stove and such to do their laundry so that means that you, you got a day that you're not cooking because you're doing your laundry and that's like no one talks about about Leonardo da Vinci's laundry lady but she was just as critical to his existence as uh you know his art was to the art world so um that's well I'm maybe not necessarily going to that level of depth I am trying in my story because it's something that's really important to me is this focus on community and this focus on like this anti-individualism sentiment that I'm trying to get into my work and I don't know how much it's succeeding because I live in a society that's really you know pro individualism um it, it's hyper individualist to the point that we're sometimes we're told oh you can't share like if you're having a bad day with other people because that's being a burden on them that's trauma dumping or whatever um and you know are obviously to you shouldn't just like dump all your emotions in someone else and hope that they fix it, especially if they're not in a place where they can handle it themselves. But at the same time, you know, a community or a society culturally better to, suited to handling um, the feelings of its individual's members would be undoubtedly better because it would just be more empathetic to everybody. And then everybody would feel safe feeling their emotions and then also without having to feel like they have to act on them every single second. Um, so I don't know, that's, I've just, so I've just been thinking a lot about that, and at some point I've, I've been saying, I've been joking and saying that I'm gonna need to start doing just, like, my own video essays on my work, and, like, on, and how it relates to adjacent works and the other works I'm consuming around me, because, um, I don't know, like, I really want to... I feel like I'm not the smartest person when it comes to analyzing stories, that I would like to be, I would like to be so smart and so good at analyzing stories so that I can put that, those elements that I see in other stories that I love so much into my own work. I want my work to be cool and interesting and like um, character driven and like really about the characters. But I also, as much as I want it to be like, I mean, not a moral grandstanding, but I want it to be an accurate and good reflection of um, what I genuinely believe about the world, and I don't want to, like, accidentally espouse values that I don't actually believe, you know what I mean? Um, like, I don't want some, I don't want to be one of those people that, like, later down the line, you know, neo-Nazis are like, oh man, she totally was talking about us, because I wasn't, I promise. I mean, unless I was saying that you, you suck, but I wasn't. <laughs> so, anyway, I've been thinking a lot about broad, strokes, structural aspects of my work, and, um, yeah, I guess I just, um, I know that's, this was probably really fake, I really need to do, that, and not analytical, that was extremely narrative, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, I guess I really do need to do one of those mm, essays where I can, like, write out my analysis first, because otherwise I just go on a long ramble, <laughs> it sort of beats around the point instead of actually saying the thing, cutting to the, the quick of the thing, so, yeah, maybe, maybe I guess be excited for that video, but, 
uh, yeah, I hope you still enjoyed mm, uh, this letter despite its um, more amateur writing, and I will see you next month for Two Without Voices.